Um, we are very fortunate to have Hanalina Rogerberg in from New York, from flew in last night to come and talk to us about her work. Um, she is a painter, and I'm reading off of her website bio, but she paints um, both figuratively um, and has and is interested in language. So this place between a kind of um, Rep representation that's outside of language and then a play with language. She's very good with language, you will see. Um, and I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, her history. She has a BFA from San Francisco Art Institute um, and an MFA from Yale. She um, most recently had a show, I guess, in um, Dortmund Bodega in Oslo in 2011, a solo show. She's been in had solo shows at the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati, Vancouver Art Gallery, group shows, um, MIT List Center, Whitney Museum, Aldrich Museum, um, among many others. She got an NEA grant in 96, a Guggenheim Fellowship in 99. Anonymous was a woman grant in 2003, an OCA grant to publish a catalog of her work um, in 2009. And she's currently an associate professor at Rutgers, but previously, about 15 years ago, taught at um, the University of Washington, so knows the Pacific Northwest a little bit. So let's welcome Hannah Lina. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. Thanks a lot to Shaw, specifically. <laughs> I'm going to invite you all to interrupt me at any point and ask me anything if you'd like to uh, have me um, return to something or interject. It's a lot harder for me to talk about my own work than anybody else's, of course. And sometimes I don't know what is relevant to know uh, in order for the points that I identify as necessary uh, I don't always know whether they are necessary either, but if you'd like me to return to something or you would like to ask things underway, please, please don't hesitate. I'm going to show you two examples of uh, a monk painting. I grew up in Oslo, Norway, and I didn't really see much painting in person other than uh, Edward Munch. And the first 10 years of leaving Norway as a young student, I forswore any indebtedness to him. And um, later, I think, became a tad humbler about what, in fact, I did absorb and learn and call upon, called upon later in my development. And one of the things that are specific for my memory of him and memory of my uh, encounters with the paintings are a particular period in his life when he is still struggling with the type of learning that he underwent. He was trained in a um, highly, highly naturalistic rendering school of naturalism and at some point he writes in his journal when he is in his early 20s how he's not really interested in painting what he sees, what he finds useful and what he is now compelled to do is to try to re-see something that he couldn't tolerate seeing when he was young and in this painting he describes a vision when he's 11 of his um, younger sister dying and their aunt sitting by her bedside. And he remembers opening the door onto this and closing his eyes so that he only sees it through the scrim of his eyelashes. Then deciding to try to make a revisit to this the eye of painting, 
is, a, is an exercise in real frustration. He has one manner of painting that isn't really serving since his invention really hasn't been exercised just yet. So the painting just leaves this embattled and scarred record of someone's desire to articulate something, he wanting to re-see it, and the manner, the tools available to him having a kind of misalignment to it. And somehow the moving part for me is this, this quantity between the, the vocabulary available to him uh, and the insistence on this subject that, that forces the hand, that forces the modifications to this vocabulary. And he uh, describes painting the painting and then dragging a uh, loaded brush above and below the edge of the painting with sort of scumbled umber to mimic the effect of looking at this through half-closed eyes. And it's this more than it is the maudlin subject that is moving to me. Later on, there are many, many different kinds of themes and inventions that are not as sort of resistance driven and not quite as interesting to me. Another painter uh, whom I only know one works, work of is a uh, Davignon Pieta. It's in the Louvre. I didn't see it until I was grown up. Um, you know, I was in my 30s when I first saw it. But I had a small reproduction of it. And I tried to make paintings from it because it had this extremely strange impossibility proposition built into it. And it's from the extreme south of France in the 13th century. It's 1399, 14th century, rather. And it is a strange landscape painting with a rudimentary horizon line. There is a gilded field behind the heads <clears throat> that is embossed with halos. So whatever is minimally spatial in that landscape quickly gets refuted by that you know, relief of the, the gilded halo. You have a conglomerate um, sort of idiomatic mashup between a Byzantine Madonna, like you would see in Russian icons, a very, very disembodied, stretched, boneless Madonna. You have a um, northern Flemish Christ who's bent and dead and sort of broken back on her lap and then on either side of them is maybe a contemporary of the painter who stands in for Catherine and John and then at the very far corner is this um, the figure of the the donor the commissioner of the painting and I always saw a young and fervent and very ascetic looking Jimmy Carter when I looked at this painting. <laughs> and so there are all of these things that shouldn't work together. There are totally different times, historic time as in the contemporaries, it's mythic time of the, of the Christ and Mary. Uh, it's, the, it's the actual sort of factual time of the donor. And all of it somehow ought to cancel each other. And instead, it, the contradictions embedded in the painting heightens the power of it for me. And that experience of having models of works that, if deconstructed by all rights, shouldn't add up, but somehow does or somehow exceeds their sum became a really, really important model for me. And I grew up, uh, drew a lot from life, and then left Norway. And being 3,000 miles away from where I had grown up, 
suddenly made me want to look at things that I couldn't otherwise tolerate looking at, not even through half-closed eyes, right? And not having any painting culture, but having in my hand this vocabulary of figures I've drawn a lot from life, uh, made me want to re-see some things, not as if I had witnessed this, but re-see or reconfigure a particular sort of psychic event uh, that would have formed me, that I, uh, that I have a sense of inevitability about. And I am sure everyone recognizes patterns of behavior in their histories or their family's histories that somehow, despite one's best effort to figure a life that presents alternatives to those, uh, somehow magically ends up repeating them anyway. And that moment of grooving those kinds of behaviors, the sorts of uh, formatting of patterns, what those moments were, were not necessarily available to me in, in conscious history or, or even available to me in memory, but might be known to me indirectly through echoes of observed behavior or, or, or things that had been inherited, really. And I imagined that if I tried to find a way to make paintings approach a psychic equivalent to those events that they might somehow get neutralized. I am talking as if I knew all of this when I started and that was not the case. I started all of these paintings with an extremely specific setup in mind, a highly self-righteous version of events where I had cleanly assigned roles of who was doing and who was being done to, and somehow making this visible on large, large scale. These would be nine and 10 feet paintings. And as I would be painting them, not only would they be unwieldy and in no way cleanly kept to their assigned categories or outlines of roles, they would bleed and they would interfere and they would you know, uh, be large enough that they would envelope me and, and simply by my peripheral vision I would be implicated in them. But they would also somehow be insisting on being changed. They would change numbers or, or positions or sex or uh, ages. And In the course of painting on these very, very large paintings, and I'm just showing you an example of a painting that's clearly not formally resolved, and none of these were, but they did solve this one premise, which was a really, really rash and simplistic and highly personal, personally favorable version of my history presented to the canvas to, to reflect back at me. I, I wanted this scene again. And somehow in the course of meeting the paint's resistance, the impossibility of trying to solve this as a painting, the largeness of these, these skins folding me in, these roles, the cleanliness of a signed doer and being done to, all of these were irreversibly polluted. And the experience of having these constant one up man experiences of my, my vanity in retelling certain versions, having a, having a kind of a slap on my nose in seeing how, well, the retelling relies on polarities and cleanly assigned differences. What happens if 
you include the before and the after. Um, you include the the the. Um, you Im implicate both the the doer and the being done to um, in their configuration. And in this case, I'll just very briefly talk about the figure on the right, which appears to be the active one who holds the central figure and doing some kind of regurgitation or kiss or air or something like that. But the balance of that figure is kept by the left leg of the central figure wrapping around the calf. And so somehow the only premise that I knew to trust in these paintings had to do with I start with this really black and white version of things. I end or I leave, abandon the painting when it somehow has been irrevocably reversed. And I was at San Francisco Art Institute uh, at the very end of painting this and painting was completely beyond the pale. There was nobody painting and that was totally ideal because um, somehow the promise of being outside of your own history, no one really mattering, you not mattering, um, no one really coming to look, gave me a particular kind of freedom that was akin to a theatrical staging for one. And somehow these very large paintings um, taught me what was necessary, what, what my needs for them demanded. So one of the things that became important was to find a way to teach myself to paint skin and be able to differentiate between thick, uh, well-padded skin versus thin, uh, susceptible, wet, maybe heated or cooled skin, skin that would show its vascular temperature underneath itself so it would be transparent and suggest a susceptibility to leaking or absorption. And that is what somehow differentiated my, my palette. I would use parts of myself. I would sometimes you know, draw from other people's bodies for reference, but many of these were just invented and many of them were not convincing naturalistically, but somehow I painted until I thought they were persuasive at the time. Looking back now, I'm seeing that many of them are like highly, highly stretched and um, stylized. So some of them were little cloaked jokes to myself, like this little sort of celestial intervention where somebody has taken a 70s sofa and made a kind of makeshift fake cloudscape on it. Um, I'm just showing you a few examples of these large figurative paintings where the premise often would be an aversion or a mix between a kind of terror at re-encountering something but also driven by a particular yearning, a particular desire. And at this point I was reading about Temple Grandin from one of Oliver Sacks' accounts of her. And all, I'm sure you have heard of Temple Grandin now. I know that there is a movie that was based, uh, a TV uh, biography. <clears throat> She's a autistic, um, highly skilled designer of agricultural facilities. She describes herself as not really being able to sustain any kind of human contact or growing up, she couldn't stand human touch. But in her teens, she was allowed uh, to study at a particular agriculturally focused college and loved being around big animals and could easily read big animals in ways that she could not her fellow humans. 
one of the assignments there was to design <coughs> a pen, a machine that would lift cattle from one pen to another. And from observation, she noticed how freaked out the cows were when they got isolated and kept by themselves away from the flock and how instantly calming the pressure of other cows up against their sides had. The effect of that was so instantaneous. So she modified a particular machine that normally simply lifted them on the platform to having sides, a pneumatic kind of sleeve around the cow itself to calm it before you lifted it. While doing this, she tested it on herself and found it this insanely kind of uh, epiphany of, a, of a relief. And so she has modified it and refers to it as a hugging machine now, and it is used widely in treatments. And she uses it twice a day. She has a kind of pneumatically adjustable pressure point, and she spends time inside this hugging machine that she controls time and pressure and, and, and uh, input and output from. And the desire for this uh, sort of skin sandwich for me would be a similar sort of what could you do that would both like keep at bay your worst terrors but also meet your biggest needs. It's called Hang of Pia Mater, and one of the things that I am reading about at this time is the brain and how the brain's absorption of input formats how we become sentient beings, like the very, very first impressions has the has the, has the power to actually groove the, the neuronal tree in ways that structurally might predict our later uh, receptivity or predilections for certain experiences, both what we can absorb and what we, what we uh, are then in some ways physiologically equipped to, to do, perform. The pia mater is a Latin name on the innermost membrane of your head, of your brain. It's the capillary membrane that provides oxygenated blood to your gray matter. It also means mother skin, if you translate it from Latin. And the notion of your mother's skin really somehow being your very, very first thought when we know that prior to smell or hearing or sight, it is our skin that absorbs the very, very first stimulus. And ergo is the very first thing that begins this process of formatting you as a sentient being. It's just the, the weird poetry that you find in anatomy books. It's great. Uh, I didn't make this painting, unfortunately. <laughs> we, uh, this was another example of a, of a painting that is so incredibly modern and so weirdly efficient despite things that you would find like, that's pretty unreasonable. And the unreasonableness, this is Fra Angelico, it's from a uh, series of beautiful <coughs> frescoes in San Marco in uh, Florence in Italy. And I didn't see it until I was actually in Seattle and got to spend one semester uh, in Rome with the UW. <coughs> and it is the blindfolded uh, Jesus who is being mocked. And being blindfolded means that he couldn't actually vouch for the rest of the body but that one hand that hits him. <clears throat> and
and that has been given a paint, you know, that's visible. Or the head that's blowing a spitball on him, that is painted, but not the rest because that hasn't actually affected him <clears throat> sensorily. He can't, he can't see it, he can't hear it, but he can feel it on his skin. So, okay, that is given visibility in the painting. And that sort of the diagrammatic presentation of how we secretly somehow order ourselves in the world, the supreme arrogance of our subjectivity that what, what doesn't actually hit me, I'm not really sure exists. That this painting is you know, done 600 years ago uh, and, and somehow naturally finds a way to describe that condition is just so enviable. So the next series of paintings, I am scaling down a bit, and I am thinking much more specifically about what this imprinting means and what, as a language, inherited our experiences somehow formats the type of experiences we later, A, both uh, are equipped to register, uh, and B, the kind of experiences that we perpetuate back onto the world. And these imprints, whether they be things that we know are irreversible, such as the very, very early exposure to certain sounds, for example, that if you haven't heard a particular kind of pitch or particular <laughs> tone by your uh, fifth month, apparently your ear can, and at no point later in life, learn to distinguish that. Uh, we know that in many, many other cases, the brain stays plastic for the rest of your life. But there are certain things that are irreversible. And there are also, of course, very specific, different schools of psychoanalysis that in varying degrees identifies this as a set and predetermined givens, this grooving, this uh, formatting of your sensory brain tree, and others who says that, no, 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 it's, it stays fluid much longer. But my interest in this had to do with what it means to be an autonomous subject back out into the world if the tools you've been given, the, the, the sensory imprints and vocabularies you're equipped with disposes you to do things you would rather not? And would there be ways that you somehow can make exceptions? Could you find ways to be outside of that vocabulary? Are there ways to sit and form an agency outside of this kind of inherited behavioral language? So these paintings are smaller, but they still somehow just use the palette that I invent for the skin that can describe, as I said, skin where it is bunched up and thickened and maybe slows down that exchange between the, the categorical roles that I start with and the places where the skin perhaps gets taut and stretched and translucent and can absorb that exchange much quicker and sped. It can, it can be speeded up. And that palette is just what I then invent the rest of the painting with, that I simply apply that to the rest of the painting. So many of these paintings look as if they are um, some vague kind of, the skin simply extends to the very edge of the paint, to the edge of the canvas. I don't know, this is more landscape or atmospheric, perhaps. So this is called Tongue Audit, 
<laughs> you get to get imprint the nose. Whomever gets uh, licked has now been given a particular set of uh, smell registries that they cannot go outside. <laughs> All done under the guise of a loving gesture, of course. Or the eyeball gets imprinted. Many of these gestures that I get stuck on repeat themselves in many different paintings and often have that ambivalence between things that appear loving or helpful or benevolent but may show themselves to be predatory or have very, very different aims in mind and the kind of colonializing of someone else's <laughs> uh, sensory apparatus is, a, is, is, of course, that. On the other hand, all consciousness or shared experience depends on this, depends on the compromises of uh, inherited languages or inherited formats. And so what my particular yearning in these paintings, I think, came from had to do with finding the capacity to go outside the rules or finding a way to make um, license for subject that sits outside language and language then meaning both what you know the known be it smell or sight or hearing or textual and the bodies would often have uh, the signs of adult experience many of the bodies would show their own uh, kind of synchronic histories alongside the one that I'm painting, the kind of narrative that I'm painting, the bodies might show signs of scarring or uh, the pigmentation that happens after having had a child or, um, or things that, that identify lives lived. <clears throat> but the bodies would have a consciousness that the heads rarely did and in this case, there's an expression in a region of having your, your head under your arm, which in English would be translated to sort of your, your head is up your ass. And you don't, you are uh, simply a, um, you know, taking up three dimensional space, but it's not consciousness. And in this case, the head is simply sensorily identifying a pulse or, um, Being, being the beating brain, being the be, be, beating heart maybe, but not the brain. The edges became more and more important in these paintings and where things obviously got cropped by choosing a, a square format so it's no longer that sort of historical painting rectangle. I didn't know what I was doing about the large paintings, but I had certain ideals that I wanted to measure my uh, ambition against. But now there is a choice involved in the square format and the, the cropping, where things get stopped and where they are either contained by that cropping or where they insist on extending, where the subject is insistent enough that it exists outside or perhaps even more fully outside the frame, outside the language of the painting. And that stays interesting to me. And that suggestion of a too muchness, that the, the frame is asked to hold something it cannot, is also, it's obviously in this painting, that there is a, um, 
not just a doubling, but an overlapping that exceeds what the, the figurative continuum would suggest is one way that I do that. <coughs> just not showing you a video, but this is a small video um, that I just wanted to introduce as a, um, a project that I do to my class where I ask people to identify some continuous problem in their work and then you make something outside of your normal discipline that in no way tries to solve but does the opposite. It tries to as precisely as possible uh, embody what the problem is. And having done that to other students, I a couple of years back did it to myself and made this rather helpless video, but very, very, very instructive for me in that what I was doing was making this little video loop where I'm following a, a seam in the body, sometimes w one body, and the camera simply sits as close to that seam so it identifies the Y, <laughs> like a zipper, where that seam gets split open. So the, the camera simply tracks the opening, the splitting apart. And in some ways, it can formally simply be read as a, um, you know, a figure ground problem that is animated Y, as it splits down, 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 manages always to be so close up or so fast that you never quite identify where on the body it is. So there are parts that get hairy and you expect to you know, end up in bits that you actually never do. So there's no way of actually naming and identifying where these things are. And at a certain point you stop trying and you relinquish, you surrender, <laughs> you stop scratching and you simply begin to look at the why and you begin to stop seeing the body as the solid positive and the split as the negative and you reverse it. Um, and the enduring feeling is at some point not mental at all but has to do with the awareness in your skin of this blissful, unconscious, gift of a pressure that simply confirms where you are and where the rest of the body ends and the sudden departure of that pressure, the sudden ripping away of it that shocks your body into conscience, consciousness, sorry, not conscious, consciousness in, your, in that membrane that suddenly is now abandoned. And uh, that grief or that, that sudden weird mourning consciousness in the skin, I think, is a really instructive way for me to think about my work. Uh, Self-portrait when I'm 37 weeks. It's a large painting. <laughs> it's called Bouquet. So, I don't, yeah, where the subject sits here is deep in the middle. Um, I have, uh, I do these projects outside of painting as a sort of good, instructive, parallel vision back in to, to, to somehow structure self-reflective process in there. And in this case, it was also the experience of having a, uh, a child and experiencing in some ways very physically all of the, the, the kind of deflective metaphoric terrors that I had uh, painted from the opposite end in earlier works. This is a small project where I simply uh, make a kind of 
parentheses of the time while she is nursing, and uh, this is her ear imprinted on my arm during that process. So, the beginning and end of that. I'm revisiting in a painting called Tong Audit from the opposite end what it would mean to rather describe this. Uh, I think in that painting it is the tongue leaving behind its scent imprint on the, on the nose. Um, this is a later copy of a copy, or rather version of a version of a painting of another licking of the eyeball. And having become increasingly impatient with a degree of control that I now have over the bodies, I decided to find ways to somehow upend what my control would be, my remove would be. The control, I think, is what I identify as being slightly distant to the subject. In the earlier paintings, I didn't really know what I was doing, and I was learning as I went along, and they were enormous, large enough that they felt that they really enveloped me, and I couldn't really see their beginning and end when I was close up. And so their shame at being naked was, in some cases, my shame. And that was also a good compass for, is this actually getting somewhere? Is this as much stripping me of my presumptive um, uh, oversimplifying, or, or do I stay safely at the remove? And, um, the next series of paintings are seeing if some of that undressing, that kind of vulnerability, can be restored in different ways for me. And so it's a dumb little attempt here at imagining what the eyeball being licked is seeing. And thinking about ways to sneak up on one sense via another would be possible to somehow circumvent this inherited imprint, this limited register. So in this case, I am, I am thinking about, well, what if I only know what I love through my nose rather than my eyesight? So this is called sniff preempt sight. This is actually a very large painting again. And the more I am somehow <coughs> managing to uh, leave behind the need to control my paintings, the better they feel to me right now. And therefore, many of these paintings are orchestrated so that everything is wet at the same time. And that either, as in the case of that dumb little tongue audit lick painting, I squeegee the paint out where distinguishing details or contours and outlines and boundaries gets dissolved. It also has the effect of smashing the paint right back up against me so that spatially it isn't deep. It's not in a, in, a, in a safe remove from me. It is absolutely on me when I am doing that. So that is uh, this four body mountain fount fountain, human fountain in the mountains happened there. Uh, this is another very large painting where I have uh, just a small, almost invisible, little vignette of figures at the far uh, lower left, where this, a similar kind of exchange of uh, a small morsel being held up against someone's mouth and the equivalent gesture 
below in the dark, much the way the leg reverses the balance of power in that large painting I showed you, uh, does a little nipple tweak in the, in the shade. But I don't know if you can see that. That might just be more for me for, than for anybody else to see. Another uh, series that also happened around this time has uh, as its outspring from that encounter of squeegeeing things out and somehow <coughs> losing their, what I thought was necessary details and surface distinguishing marks, but restoring my intimacy with them and my vulnerability to them at the same time. And I'm reading again a uh, short story by Honoré de Balzac called The uh, Unknown Masterpiece. Right now I'm also <laughs> learning that the painter Charlene von Heil is uh, actually calling a lot of her painter paintings uh, after this. Uh, Frenhoferin, she calls herself. And the short story is about an old, old painter named Frenhofer, and he is in the process of trying to make his final and lasting masterpiece. And he's somehow lost his model. He's trying to make a painting, I forget now who, um, apocryphal mythic uh, goddess. And he asks one of his friends, a fervently devoted uh, acolyte, whose name is Poussin <laughs> in the story, for help, and Poussin offers up his beautiful, devoted girlfriend to model for Frenhofer. Um, Frenhofer and the model locks themselves up, uh, paint, 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 and then at some point the friends insist on seeing how progress goes, is allowed in by Frenhofer and sees to their dismay and shock that rather than have it be a fully accomplished uh, last masterpiece. It is an impenetrable, thick, crusted wall of paint marks, inarticulably scumbled surface. Uh, the only thing that has failed to be entirely covered up is a beautifully rendered ankle at the lower right-hand corner. And Frenhofer registers the shock on their, his friends' faces and suddenly sees what he has done and locks himself up, burns all his works, and dies that night. And that's the end of the story. Uh, if you have ever seen, uh, actually the story itself has been filmed many times, but the best version is actually not identifying this as their basis at all, but it's the Godard movie called Contempt, where um, it's Brigitte Bardot in the role of the, the pimped out uh, muse. Anyway, the painting that Frenhofer, to his shock, cannot see until he has other sets of eyeballs in his studio is a painting that somehow, like many, many, many people have used it in many different ways, but it's also, of course, talking about the inability to penetrate, the, the odd restoration of the wall itself as the final encounter, uh, the final in intimacy. Um, alongside all of these interesting sort of parallels to my experience in my studio, <clears throat> I also see a Richter show, a retrospective at MoMA, where Richter, among all of his virtuosic, you know, encyclopedic examples of high, high photorealism and <clears throat> experimentations and politically charged, neutral, banal, everything across everything, uh, somehow has also one room of small Polaroids <clears throat> and paintings from these Polaroids of his wife and young child. And, uh, they, his third wife, right? And a young, young child on her arm that's beautiful. These small paintings similarly are scraped and scumbled and abandoned, much like his other work. But rather than register the same sort of 
um, nonchalance, the kind of nonchalance of uh, a passionate atheist, uh, passionate agnostic in, in his other works, these paintings register for something very different. They are not cool. They are not... <clears throat> uh, they're not blasé at all. They are, they are hot, and they somehow speak to a frustration with not measuring up to what he wants them to do. It's, it's about an inadequacy that they're abandoned or scraped over, not that they are, yeah, just as good as anything else. And I love those paintings. I think they're beautiful paintings. On the other hand, having just had a child and experiencing the ease with which he looking at his young little family, can call down historic tropes and seamlessly <clears throat> conflate it with his current experience. Pisses me off. And uh, I imagine <clears throat> having no longer now the kind of Madonna child trope uh, will never, ever, ever feel metaphoric to me again. Uh, I, I think that, well, I'm going to try to find some other equivalent spot on the male body that uh, is equally resistant to metaf metaphor. So I paint these dumb pun balls. And they are very large, but they are very specific about just looking at balls, which feels in and of itself like a, a weird uh, sort of landscape practice. They're never still. <laughs> uh, they're also really interesting for that one seam that uh, is this really early embryonic scar uh, referring to a tiny, tiny stage of um, equivocation between what it should be, what it should manifest. Uh, which is really beautiful to me. And these paintings somehow uh, also scrape and scumble um, and restore this weird, like, uh, I, it's not something I can, you know, it's not something I can, can stay distant from. Uh, I really want to, <laughs> but they are... Uh, <laughs> They are uh, scraped to such a place where they become, as I am painting them, uh, unfamiliar, that they could be uh, almost anything. They could be heads, they could be portraits. Stepping back and looking at them from afar, they restore themselves to, to the image of balls. But, but um, when, it is, when it was close up, it uh, did do that sort of, I am outside of uh, the realm of being identifying things with names and words and outside of language doing them. That idea of somehow hunting down where our common tropes of metaphor breaks down is also really interesting to me, since that seems to be both a place where uh, we can restore a defenselessness to ourselves via, via metaphor. We can choose metaphor when something becomes too intolerable to be spoken and somehow fly under the radar of our preparedness for that thing enough that we can be fully, fully undefended when we do encounter it in a, def in a, in a deflected form. Um, but in the case of balls, when everything else can be balls, like the Twin Towers are balls, the head of Holofernes are balls, but balls themselves somehow, as a premise, will not be anything but balls. Um, and then somehow scraping and painting on them long enough until they do transform. Uh, it was a dumb but quick and satisfying thing to do. And this experience of trying to find a way to make 
the painted canvas be as much a wall as I could make it, so I could muster while still retaining the specificity of someone's presence stays in these paintings. They're relatively small, they're like, yeah, I think if any of you have seen the two paintings at the Hadrian, you know their size. And um, this is a painting where I worked from life, but uh, while the paint was wet, I scraped and uh, reactivated the brush independent of what it initially described. So that it, it, it was a failed painting. I uh, painted one person twice in a sort of fictional engagement with uh, himself. And in the course of scraping it down, finding a kind of new and incoherent but insistent agency in the brush and continuing it and somehow restoring this presence uh, that the, the brush somehow behaves as if it articulates, but it is no longer articulating something representational. And somehow this, this feels like subject uh, to me. So that happens more and more in these paintings. Uh, doing dumb mind games is necessary for me, and I think, as I said earlier, the propensity from jumping to conclusions or doing a kind of sloppy, too, f too quick summation of what I think my ideas are, one way that painting helps that is its slowness and is its resistance and its uncontrollability. And one of the difficulty in believing my, my figures during this period is finding new ways to sort of sneak up on the encounter of having a presence in my painting, having something that I have a moment of, a, of bashfulness in front of. And these are uh, paintings made on linen on, uh, of my, my reindeer pelts. I, Growing up in Norway, that was part of uh, <laughs> physical ed was to, in March and April, ski up in the mountains and dig yourself into a snow side, mountainside, and sleep overnight for like two or three days and then ski down to Oslo. And I hated it and we froze our asses off, but at some point my cousin gave me a, a reindeer to sleep on and it's phenomenally insulating. The hairs break off because they are hollow, so it's not a nice looking you know, pelt for any kind of uh, decorative reasons to have around, but to sleep on, it's unmatched in its uh, insulation. So that, the encounter of, of uh, in some ways, it's impersonal enough to be a hugging machine, but it is also clearly a presence was promising, that it is also already flat and um, deformed as a sentient being seemed um, like a, almost a painting before it was painted. Part of its pleasure for me had to do with trying to make this dumbly literal endgame proposition to it that I would simply stand there with a hair of the brush, with a hair of the pelt and try to order it and describe it and somehow you know, assign it within the language of painting. And so that doesn't go at some point, it just <laughs> ruptures. And the paint itself just registers at some point where that is just impossible. And my, my wingspan is the, the, the measure of these wet, brushed out places of uh, Agnes Martin's paintings. I don't know if you know this, but she's really tall. She was, she's dead now. But all of her paintings were scaled to her height and her width, the, width, the, the widest of her fingertips and the height of her, uh, she was more than six feet tall. So all of her paintings referred to her, uh, her physical limit. And uh, 
when she reached 80, she scaled it down because she had shrunk so much. <laughs> but these were my, my attempts to somehow encounter a similar equivalence of my limits uh, to the painting. And the furs become really important for many reasons and very satisfying, strange, uh, series. They're very large. Uh, a totally, totally strangely uh, different, but later joined uh, impulse is a um, this, the saving up of like culling different materials. I'm sure you have that in your process book, you know, that you don't know really why you're cutting that out of a paper and putting it in there, but you have it somehow. Was my uh, first experience of seeing Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's face when he was plastered all over every newspaper and tabloid uh, upon his capture in 2003. And it became a meme of sorts where all that was abject and despicable and um, evil axis based Semitic furry. Uh, he, he, you could see it used as, um, you could see Rosie O'Donnell's head transposed on his body if you, uh, if you know that, that it became a kind of universal insult. The face of him and the, the portrait that you're seeing to the left there in the middle is done immediately upon his capture when he's been pulled out of uh, hiding. And the t-shirt the is really blasted and dirty. Uh, he's mussed up. He, uh, he, he looks distinctly uh, unprepared, obviously, for this formal portrait. The paradoxical deliberate mussing up of him and the the absolute classical formality of his portrait, however, the, the perfect confluence of the oval of the t-shirt opening with his head and the framing, and my odd doubleness in my first encounter with it makes this an image that somehow returns and returns and returns in my brain. And one of the doublenesses occurred upon my initial seeing it, when, of course, I can understand its rhetor rhetoric, its, its strategic uses. I am fluent in understanding its uh, propagandistic purposes. On the other hand, I am also having this sudden and very inexplicable simultaneous recognition of something that has to do with being a kind of fellow animal that sees uh, the must fur and having this impulse to like lick my thumb and just like brush the fur down, just like smooth that fur down. And I don't know why that becomes such a distinct uh, and, and, and kind of fruitful paradox, but the encounter of my fluid, my, my, my clever fluidity with all of its references, all of its strategic uses, and the, ap the absolute opposite impulse of identifying a kind of a mammalian commonality, uh, and a, and a kind of furtive act of like, let's clean that up a little, is really, really compelling to me. And, and trying to find a way to practice or, or exercise what that muscle is that chooses that second response over the overtly linguistic first one, the, the shared,
bandwidth of reading its intention and instead listening to a different frequency of what is shared, what is a, um, uh, an extension of my, my uh, empathy with it. Uh, so a few paintings that just takes advantage of the already classical layout of, uh, of his portrait and thinking about my brush as a tongue. Uh, and jumping from this, which is, these are very small and very quick paintings, and I go on a um, sabbatical for a year and work in uh, Oslo in a long, half-empty, enormous apartment filled with other people's paintings, an old man who has died there. And I uh, initially tried to like stow them away so that I have some wall space to work in. And at some point I had to abandon that and uh, a few of the large old paintings remained and I, I put some old muslin, some, some canvas over them to just try to give myself some uh, visual neutrality in the room to start to paint. I have as my stated objective while there to paint a painting a day and to examine, to extend the Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's uh, painting and fur. <laughs> uh, and what happens while I am there is this, the, the idea of representation, an idea of presence and where presence occurs. Uh, they, they start to conflate. As I am trying to, with real discipline, structure one trajectory of thought of these paintings accrued day by day in one, one sort of extension of, of subject and have, say, the fur on the other side of the wall and then a third body of work starting elsewhere, it quickly becomes clear that as a model, three-dimensional sort of scale model of how my brain works is that whatever I am thinking about ostensibly straight ahead will invariably escape and exist somehow peripherally. That Where I'm not thinking about it, that is where it will happen. Where I'm cleaning off the brush that I am using while I am painting straight ahead, that is where it will happen. So this room starts to both have um, the paintings that, are, that is already there, the covered paintings, uh, the, the portrait of Khalid Shaikh Mohammed and his um, The, the, the kind of skin of uh, rhetoric that prevents his his um, person or his, his identity to be to be seen. Uh, of course, we know what it means to have a hood over our heads, also in this context. But in this case, it's simply making a, a negative painting of that living room and then making a positive out of that one covered portrait that remained in there. This is a small sight into what it starts to look like. <laughs> um, not a particularly important painting, but very fun to do. I have uh, an, the early painting of Khalid, I mean early fo photo of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is the basis for the bottom shape of him. And then in 2009, some Red Cross photographers go to Guantanamo and re-photographs uh, him together with almost 200 other inmates. And in this case, the inmates are allowed to choose how they would like to be seen within a limited selection of outfits. And uh, Khalid has at that point uh, chosen to be seen in very pristine, orthodox garb and he has his hands open on a, on a Quran 
He's a lot skinnier at that point, and he has a long, 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 pious beard. And uh, so looking at these two bodies um, of photographs, or these two versions of him, one chosen and to some extent orchestrated by himself, and the other obviously orchestrated by uh, Those who, those who pulled him out of uh, Iraq in 2003, um, finding somehow this odd and dumb uh, Russian icon idiom of the merciful mother, uh, there is a, a particular trope of Russian icons where extremely, extremely strict formulas for the icons themselves are upheld over centuries. And only tiny, tiny, tiny variations are allowed. So the code for a particular Madonna and child representation is the merciful mother. And uh, she has a, um, it's always marked by the hand, her hand or the Jesus child's hand touching each other. That either she, Jesus touches her chin or she holds a hand on top of his shoulder or arm or leg or head or something like that. So I had just made him into a merciful mother for himself. This is from a, a show I had that was called Fur and Shike. And it's only of these very quick paintings. So I'm coming to an end here. If I am talking too long, I'm sorry. <laughs> At the very end, I am showing you some uh, unfinished paintings, but uh, they have gotten very, very large again. And the imprint in this case now begins to happen by leaving the paint wet long enough that I am taking the large canvas itself and imprint, excuse me, imprinting it onto the next canvas. Not in this case, this is a, just a very, very, it's a 10 foot tall uh, galactic Tibetan fur pelt. Small rabbit fur. So this is just a small example of uh, how one generates another, but this is just uh, a, um, a trial run, this is not a painting. But these two are paintings and they start with very washy landscapes that are from sketches that I did from um, uh, Occupy Wall Street where I would go down and uh, draw from Zuccotti Park. And uh, so that is the bottom image that I then have put this pelt roar shark on top of, uh, and then have taken one of those pelts paintings and imprinted onto the next. It's a close up here where you see how they have been pulled away. And these are 10 feet tall, so they're very big, but the Culling two completely different image sources and conflating them as I am doing here. I am not sure whether these remain uh, interesting to me. I think that in some ways what is most interesting right now has to do with an immediate application of a of an insight that I had coming from the de Kooning show and walking down to attend a, a reading at the Zuccotti location and seeing how Zuccotti Park's exemplary status, it, it was exempt from the usual public parks in Manhattan because it was privately owned, so it, it couldn't be cleaned up, it couldn't be raised. Ultimately, of course, it was, but for its duration, uh, Occupy Wall Street was allowed there because it had this particular status. 
having uh, seen some of those late, uh, not the absolute latest, because they are quite crystalline again, but some of those de Koonings where it appears that the painting cannot hold, it cannot work, cannot, it's going to fall apart, it's going to fall apart. And then somehow, at the last moment, an infrastructure of order somehow saves it. <clears throat> made me walk down there and see how this strange stretched park in its rectangular form performed this kind of strange painterly role of containing <clears throat> and hemming in, obviously, but also protecting this organically forming order that morphed, uh, reverted to chaos and, and momentary anarchy and then spontaneously organized itself into pockets of perfectly efficient democracy uh, and that, that it was constantly morphing and changing like an organism but without a without a, a, a identifiable um, leader without an identifiable uh, slogan without a mediagenic mission statement uh, to, of course, the consternation of a lot of press. And the resistance to do that, the resistance to simplify for the sake of demand or for the sake of publicity, the, the slow admission of the mess being a necessary component to complexify what is complex or make nuanced what isn't black and white. Um, it, it was just an incredibly beautiful painting metaphor. And that somehow is uh, staying with me, not as a, not as a um, Zuccotti Park specific premise, but the imprint of these schematic pelts as a uh, interpretive Rorschach filter onto them. So I think that might be my very last painting. Yeah, that's where it happens right now. It's obviously in the beginning stages. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Do we have time for maybe a couple of questions? If anyone. I don't know if you, anybody interrupted me, but you should. Yeah. What I leave the edges wrong. Yeah, I think that is in the especially in the later work. Yeah. One of them had to do with um, the gift of somebody giving me linen and something I would never have bought for myself. And that the the pelt somehow perfectly mimicked, the pelts coloring mimicked linen. And so that simply piled on all of the already skin-like metaphor of canvas. And somehow the raw canvas, whether it was linen or later canvas itself, became interesting to me, became a kind of element of the subject matter. So then it became, it took on a role it made itself visible to me. So I think that is one reason. Yeah? What are your, your current project right now? What is it? Uh, the, the one I've just showed you is just what it looks like right now in my, my, my studio. And so there are two similar sized paintings that are expecting to somehow imprint upon each other. Obviously, that first painting that I had painted very, very thickly, the pelt, and then imprinted on the second, 
I go back and I modify. It's not really looking like a painting to me. And so they are not necessarily meant to be thought of as diptychs, but I know that somehow the premise for one is set by the other, and I have to work my way out of that limitation, either against or with or modify it. And uh, the images themselves are from scenes of um, the Norwegian uh, the Norwegian bomber who um, blew up a government building and then drove up to uh, an island in uh, an hour north of Oslo where there is a socialist youth group for the Labour Party, which I was part of every summer since I was 16, uh, and shot people. And the my interest in his role is that there has just been a biography issued on him by someone who attended this year-long trial and describes in quite astonishing detail certain events in his early, early life and his manifesto, I think 1,700 pages manifesto, which he publishes the same day that he goes to perform the bombing and the, the shooting, which is a manifesto identifying himself as a uh, latter-day Knights Templar and will both save uh, <coughs> Northern Europe from Islamism, uh, but it's convoluted enough that it appears to be simply a kind of con conglomerate document of someone having walked down the aisle in the ideological superstore and picked a little bit of neo-Nazism here and uh, uh, Occidentalism here and a little bit of Marxism, even from some Shia Muslim jihadist propaganda, he, he absorbs some of that. And it is entirely opportunistic as a narrative but the places where he is absolutely articulate and specific are the places that you see their early equivalents in his, in his childhood's um, traumas. And they often are astonishingly specific in their misogyny and uh, that he can't wait for science to catch up to um, producing artificial wombs so that uh, the uh, uh, female role in the reproduction of the human race can be, uh, can be, can be, can be cut out. So some of those, some of those, uh, that, that's maybe highly specific, but um, this imprint of someone's pre, conscious uh, grooving of certain experiences then are writ enormous onto the rest of the world later through the, the kind of grab bag of uh, available totalitarianist uh, models. And that is really interesting to me. I, I, I will in no way uh, attempt to, um, to match or describe or uh, uh, draw upon specifics, but I am really, really fascinated by such a um, clean, almost uh, equation as, as this book provides. I don't know if it is subject for painting, really, so we'll see. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me.